So about 10 years ago, Senator, you, you came into the Senate, and very early on in your career, you got involved in veterans' issues. What was it that drew you to that? Well, I, I think it's in my respect for the veterans. I mean, I, I've, got, I've just got to tell you, when I was a kid, uh, my school bus driver was a veteran and played trumpet, uh, and he asked me to play taps for the uh, VFW. Uh, incredible honor. Uh, got to be around World War I vets and a lot of World War II vets at that point in time. Played taps at more funerals than I really want to count but really got to know those guys at that point in time and have there was just a tremendous respect for their sacrifice to the country. And, uh, and so I don't know why I ended up on VA. I mean, Harry put me on it, but, but it's something that I've always uh, admired uh, about the folks who have served this country, uh, admired their service to this country. And uh, so, uh, and, and quite frankly, because of that experience as a VFW bugler, it helped me have this job quite frankly, give me the self-confidence to be able to, to move forward. And so uh, they've given a lot to this country, and I, th I think this country owes a, a great debt to them, and we need to live up to our promises. That we made our veterans, when they signed the dotted line, to, to go off to war and serve this country. In the 10 years you've been dealing with the issues, have there been significant changes in, in the sorts of things you're hearing? Well, yes. I mean, I, th I think the most significant change uh, that, hap that has happened uh, over my tenure is that when uh, the folks started coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the, VF uh, the veterans uh, uh, of, of Vietnam stepped up in a big, big way. And uh, I remember a, a listening session that I had in eastern Montana, and uh, one of the veterans stood up and said, you're not going to treat these folks like you treated us. Uh, and, and quite frankly, it was from the heart, and it was true. And so um, my goal was to make sure that if, if, if there was something that the veterans needed, whether it was health care or housing or education or whatever it might be, that we were going to be listening to veterans and we were going to be taking their concerns back to Washington, D.C. and doing our level best to address those concerns. And so I, I, until, until that point in time, the Vietnam veterans who were, were dealt really a raw deal when they came back home from, from Vietnam through no fault of their own, um, really have stepped up and, and made a big, big difference. And then, of course, there's other things that, that have entered into the picture like post-traumatic stress disorder, which uh, was a signature injury coming out of the Middle Eastern conflicts uh, that is a very, very difficult thing to deal with. But it's something that I think if we can get more information out about it being something we can fix like a broken arm, and it's not something that if we leave it, lie, and ignore it or deny it is not healthy, uh, and be able to get the health care folks that we have, that we need in the VA to deal with mental health issues, all those things go together. So there's another challenge there with, uh, with, uh, uh, with mental health issues that revolve around TBI and PTSD. So there, there's been some other things that changed. And, 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 and quite frankly, uh, when I got here, uh, the budget was discretionary. It wasn't mandatory, which was crazy. Uh, and uh, one of the first successes I had was uh, getting the mileage reimbursement bumped up. Uh, I mean, the mileage reverse when I got here, I think it was 10 or 11 cents a mile. I wouldn't even buy tires on the And this is for veterans guy. who needed to travel to get this, care? This, it was for disabled veterans who needed to get, get that travel to get care. And in Montana, it's a big state with a few people. And so uh, it's not like going around the block. It's, it's, uh, it's sometimes hundreds of miles. Uh, and, and a short trip would be 40 or 50. Right. Well, when you look at census data about where veterans are, m most are not near big cities. And, and you uh, bring with, with your constituency, bring a unique perspective of that. W what have you been able to do in working on the committee to address that issue? Well, uh, we have the second highest per capita of veterans in the country. By the way, number one is Alaska, both very rural slash frontier states. And I think the mileage reimbursement was a big, big deal to allow disabled vets to get to the clinics. And then we have, uh, we have been able to work with the VA to get a number of community-based outpatient clinics, CBOX, in the state uh, and vet centers and we're still working on the vet center angle I mean we've got we had a couple we've got four now we've got also have them on our college campuses on many of our college campuses uh, which is a very very good thing too for those veterans who are getting retrained but but the bottom line is is that access to care is critically important in, in rural America and not only do you have to have the facilities but another challenge the VA has is manpower and and making sure they have the docs and the nurses to be able to deal with uh, as a general practitioner or as a mental health professional 
is really, really important. And it's something that, quite frankly, we have not solved yet, uh, the manpower issue. And, uh, and so we need to continually work. I mean, I've got bills to increase residencies. I'm working on a bill right now that's not ready for prime time that'll increase the ability for the, man, uh, for the VA to recruit additional uh, folks in, 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 into the VA. But, but, but the, our healthcare professionals, or lack of healthcare professionals, is an incredible challenge. And it's been going on uh, since before I got here. Uh, but it's, and, and by the way, it's an incredible challenge in the civilian world too. We don't have enough docs and nurses in the civilian mm -hmm. world either. So uh, I think the VA can help lead the way on that and we're, we're pushing them to do that. Now, something, the 40 mile rule came into yeah. play with regard to, to service. Explain how that became a particular issue for you. Well, I, I think that uh, with what happened in Phoenix uh, was, it was uh, I mean, it kind of changed everything to be honest with you. I mean, I was hearing this stuff from veterans and the, the, the 40 mile rule being? The 40 mile rule was if you live more than 40 miles away from, from a, 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 a health care center, a VA health care center, you could go to the private sector. Or if you had to wait longer than 30 days, same thing, you could go to a VA. And, and I think what, what happened in Phoenix really, uh, I mean, that's why the Choice Program's here. And the Choice Program was, it's had its problems, but it was built with the best of intentions to really help places like Montana uh, in its rural nature. So how did, how did what was happening in Phoenix with the issues of, of timely care for veterans, yep. how did that play into this issue of uh, the distance and time that yep. would allow uh, veterans to seek private care? Well, I think what, what it ended up doing, what, what, what Phoenix ended up doing was pointing out that if you're living in, in a place where you can't get care from the VA in a timely manner or you live too far away from a, a, a clinic, that now is the time to be able to let those veterans access the, the local care, the, the civilian care, so to speak. And so that, that, that backlog, so to say, for folks that couldn't get their appointments in a timely manner was a, was a really a, was a, call to, a call to action. And, and that's why the Choice Program came about. And, and we tried to make it so that um, we could empower those veterans who uh, weren't able to get timely care within the VA to, to access it in a different place. Now, the rollout was not good. Uh, and quite frankly, we did some changes to, uh, to the choice program uh, that the president signed a month ago. It was a, it was a bill that I had along with uh, Senator Isaacson and uh, the Veterans First Act. And, and we've got some more work to do on the Choice Act. We're, uh, Johnny and I are working on another bill, hopefully be ready for prime time in September, October, uh, that will help fix choice uh, and, and move it forward. I, I, don't, I do not want to privatize the VA. I think it would be a big mistake to privatize the VA. But where the VA can't meet the needs of the veterans, we have to give them options. And those options ha can't break the bank, and they have to be good options for the veteran. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that's what we're working on. That's what that's we're trying to move forward. It's, it's, it's all about access. And, and I can tell you that veterans, and you know this, being served, veterans have different issues than folks who have never served. They do. And, and I think uh, the fact that the, the VA has helped hired a lot of veterans, and the fact that uh, I think that the folks who are dealing with mental health should have all possible have served because I think it just gives them a leg up on a lot of challenges and it's one of the reasons we put the vet centers in so that veterans could talk to veterans oftentimes that's as good as that's as good as a psychiatrist quite frankly so there's there's a lot of things we can be doing and I think there's a lot of things we've been doing uh, uh, but but really the bottom line is the bottom line is for me if you signed up to serve we made a promise to you the people of this country made a promise to you and we need and through the VA committee, we need to do this every day, live up to the promises that this country's made to our country's veterans. And whether it's through the Choice Program, whether it's through community-based outpatient clinics, whether it's through VA hospitals, whether it's through vet centers, whatever it may be. You talked about working with Senator Isaacson. You're the top Democrat on the committee. He's the, uh, the chair as the Republican. We're living in a time where there's a good deal of contention on, on virtually the complete range of political issues. I have a sense that there may be some difference in issues dealing with veterans. Well, I, I will tell you there probably is, but Johnny's a good guy, and uh, we, we work off of a position of agreement. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can talk about the stuff we disagree on, but we'd much rather talk about the things we agree on. And we negotiate. I mean, we negotiated an accountability bill that, that I think is a pretty darn good bill that doesn't have everything in it that I like and doesn't have everything in it that Johnny likes either. But that's what negotiations are about. You try to find the middle ground where I can live with it, he can live with it, it's something we get passed on the floor of the Senate. And provides the overall accountability that I think needs to be applied for the, for the VA. 
to make sure that the veterans get, get the care that they've earned. So uh, Johnny and I, we, I think we work from a point of agreement and then try to work out the disagreements later. Right. What's the gist of the accountability issue at the VA? Well, I think the, the accountability issue is, is when, when you have uh, folks that um, have misconduct. Uh, and, you know, I mean, whatever it might be, and there's a myriad of things out there, that the VA has the ability to document that misconduct, give them their due process, and relieve them of the duty of so being. And, uh, and I think that's what's critically important, to be able to uh, evaluate, remediate, and if necessary, after due process is given, terminate. And that hasn't been the case in the past? Well, it certainly has been a problem. And, and it's not only uh, been a problem with the rank and file, it may be even a bigger problem with some of uh, the administration. And uh, this bill also deals with some of the administration problems too. So I the think people it's a, leading hospitals and yeah, such. Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly right. We, we had a situation here a month or so ago right here in Washington, D.C. And, and when, when, <clears throat> when everybody's capable of screwing up. But the truth is, is that uh, if, if it's a bad screw up, it should be, it should be a, 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 a situation where they can be terminated. And if it's something that can be fixed, then fix it and move forward and make sure they don't do it again. So things that are important to veterans, uh, you know, health care, we've, we've talked about, jobs, employment. Um, and, and I know that one of your particular interests has to do with entrepreneurship. So maybe not just veterans working for somebody, finding a job where they can uh, be an employee, but they can perhaps start a business, be an employer. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's a, uh, I mean, you're, t you're, you're dealing with people who are very disciplined and very creative, honestly. I mean, they've been in survival mode in some cases, so you've got to be very creative in your end. So, so I think we have to make sure that the education benefits are there so that if they want to go to a technical school for a two-year degree, they can. If they want to go to a four-year school, they can. And those benefits need to be there. And it's why we've encouraged our university system in Montana, at least, to have vet centers on campus so veterans can get together and talk about their challenges. Because a lot of these folks, all these folks, are not traditional students. Uh, they, they've, they've went off, they've served, and they've come back. And, and it's really good to have that uh, support system there to help them uh, work together to get through all this stuff. But the bottom line is, is you're exactly right. The win-win deal is if they can go off to school, get trained, become an entrepreneur, start their own business, employ more people. I mean, that's the definition of a good, vibrant economy. And our military people are, are a big, big part of our economy. And, we, and uh, so th those education benefits are so critically important. It struck me as a veteran myself sometimes that, that people who have not had contact with military service look at veterans fondly but almost sympathetically, almost as if victim equals, uh, veteran equals victim. And, and uh, what, do, what do people who don't have that contact uh, need to know about veterans that, that they should and that you've had uh, in these 10 years through all yeah. this contact with veterans learned? Well, I don't think it should be veteran equals victim. That's certainly not, uh, I never served, okay? My, my brother spent 35 years in, in the Air Guard and so I was around it through him. But I think it's, it's veterans equals respect. And we need to respect the job they did for the country, not only their sacrifice, but their family's sacrifice, and move forward to live up with the promises. And, and it's as simple as that. Uh, they're not a victim. I mean, I, there was, uh, I was a little too young for, for Vietnam and I had this problem. But the truth is there were many of my uh, friends that, that, that signed up for the, for the military and, and did their gig and, and came back and, uh, and incorporated back into society. It's a little different then because it was more peacetime. When you go to Afghanistan, which is 180 degrees, or Iraq, 180 degrees off our society with different values and different people and different landscape, and it's a tough place to work in. When they come back, there's a transition time. We've got to be aware of that. We, we make great warriors. We haven't done an exceptionally good job of transitioning people back to the civilian life, so we've got to be aware of that. But it isn't a victim situation. It's a real-life situation, and we need to respect their duty uh, and the job that they've done. And by the way, if we want a volunteer military going through into the future, we have to live up to those promises or our young people are going to go, wow, this guy served or this gal served and they didn't get what they deserved. I'm not, I'm not signing up for that gig. And the military is really important for this country. So it's important to, on a whole sorts of fronts that we, we live up to the promises. What does the VA do well in, in you know, your 10 years of observing it and, yep. and what... Uh, because a lot of people uh, who, look, who look at this maybe say, uh, well, I heard terrible things about the VA, 
but uh, we hear from veterans that uh, I got particularly good care here or, or there or this sort of care. What does the VA do well? What do they do poorly and really urgently need to I'm gonna, improve? I'm going to start with the poorly and we're going to end up with the good. Okay. okay. The, the poorly is it, it, it takes too long to get through the door. Um, the appeals process has taken too long. And by the way, I hope we get that appeals process done too. That is, the, is one of the next steps on the VA committee for Senator Isaacson and myself. Um, so, uh, and we don't, we don't deal with women's veterans very well. The military's changed over the last 25 years and, 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 and women veterans are a huge part of our military and we, uh, our, our women are a huge part of our military. Women's veterans is, is, is the fastest growing uh, veteran population out there. We need to make sure our VA is equipped to take care of them. They have different health care needs. Um, and and, and, and uh, let's see, appeals. Women veterans getting through the door; those are probably the biggies. With, with, with uh, and I think all that is driven by workforce shortages. Okay, uh, the, the, there are some facility uh, changes that need to be made, but mostly it's workforce shortages. What do they do good? I can tell you. For the last ten years, I've gone around the state, and and we've talked to veterans eyeball to eyeball, and with few exceptions, once they get through the door, they love the health care. They love the people that are working there. They're very dedicated staff. Uh, they like their doctors, uh, and they want to keep them. And uh, so th they like the health care th that they're getting. In fact, my barber, who's since passed, uh, every, every two or three weeks and I'd go in and get my hair cut, he would tell me how the VA has saved his life. Uh, and, 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 and would give different examples every time. And uh, so we've got, in Montana at least, we've, we've got a good VA. And uh, we've got good people that work at the VA, and we've got uh, we've got a good director now, which is really good. And so I, I, I think, and we've built some additional community-based outpatient clinics. Our big problem in a rural state like Montana is staff. It's staff, and, and it's why when we talk about residency programs, and we talk about not only general practitioner residencies but psychiatric residencies, how important they are because many of those people will stay in the state if we can get them to do the residency there. And we will if we get those slots. It costs some money and we need to do it. Um, but, but once we do that, we can get those folks there and it'll better serve those rural frontier veterans that you talked about earlier, living in areas that aren't around urban populations. Uh, it's, it's, it's out in the sticks, so to speak. And, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, we've, we've got our challenges, but, but the bottom line is, is when I talk to vets that get through the door, they like the health care they're getting. The, um, with the CBS Radio Veterans Network, which we're about to launch, we're hoping to provide information that some veterans have had difficulty getting to. Yeah. Uh, and as we talked to veterans in, in, uh, in advance of, of uh, the project, a lot of people said, you know, this, this was accessible to me and I had no idea about it until I just happened coincidentally to talk to my buddy who, yep. who mentioned it. And so it seems that there's information out there. In some cases, it's uh, maybe not well vetted or it's uh, behind two or three pages that it's hard yeah. to navigate through. And do you sense a need for, for making this yeah. information more accessible? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're on the right track. And I think, it's, I think I applaud the effort, quite frankly. I mean, I think a lot of the veterans have served a, a lot of these folks. They want to just be left alone. They don't want to, they don't want to you, know, <laughs> you know, they're veterans. They've been told what to do. They want to go out and live their own lives now. And, and I think the ability to access this through either visual or auditory or written medium is, 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 a, is a great thing to do. And, and I think there are so many good stories that can be told about there, the vets, and there's so many stories out there that are challenges for our vets that, that I think that this network can do a, a lot of good things. Let, let me give you a, an example that happened in Montana here. Uh, it's been a couple of years ago now, but I had a vets listening session and, and um, started calling on the veterans and, and, and one guy got up and he said, you know, uh, I've got back problems and you guys, uh, the VA absolutely would not give me enough painkillers to deal with my back problems. Next guy got up and said almost the same thing. Third guy got up and said, the VA killed my kid because they overprescribed painkillers. Right. Now, there's got to be a happy medium in there, okay? But those are the kind of stories that you're going to hear on this network that, that if you're able to flesh out quite frankly, can be of value to me as a policymaker in Washington, D.C. Uh, because there are different challenges around this country, and I deal with Montana's vets all the time, and I try to stay as closely connected to those folks as I can uh, through the veteran service organizations or through their leadership to find out where the challenges are so we can help address them. But the truth is you're going to take a more global 
view of this. And I think that can be a big benefit, not only for me, but also for the VA, most importantly, for the veterans that are on the ground. Great. Anything I've not asked you that, uh, that's important, uh, you know, as, as you think about, uh, you know, when you're heading to uh, committee meetings uh, uh, well, with regard to veterans? Well, I, I just, uh, I think that, you know, this, this is a big job we're tasked with. Uh, to make sure that we do right by our veterans, that we don't break the bank in the process, because that's always a challenge too, the financial restraints that we're put under. But, uh, but in the end, uh, I think that uh, this is a good idea, and it allows people like me to just say thank you to the veterans who have served this country, and uh, we'll do our level best to live up to those promises that this country's made to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Yeah.